Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. One of the reasons that I love making this podcast for you every week is because I know what it's like to feel like you're not quite in the right place. I mean, people are nice and I love my friends, but I have a different connection with other artists. When artists get together, they light up. Normally shy or introverted people suddenly become animated and hard to shut up. That's how I know I've found my tribe. You know what I mean, right? It's like Helen Marr said in an iTunes review. When I found this, she says, it made a world of difference. Now I feel in touch again with artists. I have my peeps and they are here. First off, thank you so much, Helen Marr. And as I hope you've discovered from this podcast, you most definitely are not alone, even if it feels that way sometimes in your studio. Savvy Painter has been downloaded over a million times by artists in 150 countries. This is the place where you will find your community. You'll be inspired to push your paintings to the next level and discover how to confidently share your voice with the people who are waiting to hear it. And that's just from listening to the podcast. At least that's what people tell me. You can get even more when you join the Savvy Painter email list. When you sign up now, you get Essential Tips for Artists, a free PDF filled with inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It is that easy to join us. Greg Crayola Simpkins was born in 1975 in Torrance, California, just south of Los Angeles. And if you're not familiar with his work, but you recognize the name, you might remember that Greg is also one of the pro team artists with Drakel Art Supplies. In this interview, Greg talks about his start as an artist and how he honed his skills painting large scale works, both in abandoned buildings around Southern California and in his own backyard, thanks to a very smart dad. After receiving his bachelor's degree in studio art from California State University at Long Beach, Greg worked as an illustrator for various clothing companies and bands. He went on to work on video games at Activision, where he helped create Tony Hawk and Spider-Man properties. In 2005, Greg decided to pursue his own vision as a full-time artist. Since then, he's been featured in numerous group shows and has successfully sold out solo exhibitions. Greg talks about the techniques he uses to create his large-scale acrylic paintings. And as you will hear, his work is fueled by his boundless curiosity and a dedication to excellence. Greg talks about how he and his wife, Jen, partner in both running the business and raising their kids. And he also shares tips that you can use to run your own studio. In 2009, Greg developed I'm Scared, his own brand of clothing, merchandise, and accessories to further expand his art into more everyday mediums that can be worn and enjoyed by his diverse fan base. Greg's work can be found at imscared.com. Here is Greg Crayola Simpkins. Greg, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm excited to talk to you today. Thank you for having me. This should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about about you and how you got started? I'd kind of love to hear when you decided to dedicate yourself to your art. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Well, my name is Greg Crayola Simpkins, and the Crayola is thrown in there because of my early days as a graffiti artist. I spell it different than the crayon company. I took the Y out like pretty much within the first week of when I took on the moniker I was 17 when I started doing graffiti. I was 18 when I started writing Crayola. <laughs> and so it's that was in 1992 when I started. So I'm 42 years old now. I've been doing it for, gosh, a long time. And before that, I was just a quiet kid sitting in the back of the classroom, insistent on drawing on my notes instead of taking notes. <laughs> I I did really good in school, though. I had, I had, I was in like AP class and honors classes all through high school. But I was always drawing and doodling, and it was what I did on my free time. I would go home and draw, you know, watch cartoons and draw. Ever mm-hmm. since I was a little kid, so it, it's something I I can't remember not having a pencil, pen, crayon, whatever in my hand and drawing since I was like three or four. So it, it's just something I, I've always done. But I never thought I would do it for a living. I was always going to be a veterinarian up until (laughs) I started college. And it was the first year in college I had taken an art class because, you know, as much as I loved art, 
you know, and I was taking like, you know, pre-veterinary medicine class, like, you know, biology uh, classes and all that stuff. Yeah, that's funny. I did exactly the same thing. My, I was going to be a doctor. So I'm, I'm totally oh, with yeah. you on this. <laughs> so <laughs> those art classes were just a waste of time because they weren't going to get you into veterinarian school. Is that it? Yeah, that's right. Uh-huh. And, um, I, I told my dad, I'm like, well, I couldn't get this class. I'm just going to add this art class. He's like, that's fine. And that first year, a friend of mine named Mark Vidal, who's an older guy I, I grew up looking up to, and like he, he was just a good friend of our family. And he's also, on, on a side note, was a bass player for the punk band Circle Jerks, which also I, I really got into the punk scene out here just through those different influences. Yeah. But anyways, he was working at a baseball card company. And they decided to make pogs. And so he said, hey, Greg, why don't you come draw some of your city scenes and, and all that stuff that you do, and we'll turn them into pogs. And it was a really high-paying job for my first gig. And I just was kind of like, look, Dad, I can make money as an artist. <laughs> and he's like, well, all right. If, if that's what you really want to do, let's switch majors. And I did. And I just ended up putting my full everything into art, which I was already doing anyways because I was spray painting graffiti murals on the weekends and during the week i was kind of just all obsessed with making art in any kind of fashion so when i was able to switch my courses too it just became yeah this is what i'm going to do i'm an artist i'm going to do this for a living and it just took off from there the whole going back to the graffiti thing though that was like a good learning process too i know it's looked down upon and all that kind of stuff but me and my friends kind of took it to like you know riverbeds and burnt down buildings, places that were already destroyed and ugly and try to add cool things like characters and big colorful letters and stuff like that. We weren't trying to destroy people's personal property. We kind of took it to like rugged parts of town where stuff was kind of messed up and try to make it look cool. (laughs) I I love this. I'm curious how a quiet student in the back of the class in all the AP classes ends up going out on weekends and and doing <laughs> that. Like what what describe that transition? Well, imagine being just kind of like I was really shy and introverted too back yeah. then, not so much anymore, but it was just those awkward years. I was such an awkward like teenager with my my glasses and kind of a chubby kid, just like I, I was just shy and and these kids took notice of me these cool skater kids and they were just like hey man those drawings are awesome that you're doing because they caught me drawing one day and i'm like oh thanks you know thanks very much you know these guys were encouraging to me and they're like hey why don't you come skate with us and let's go draw or do this stuff and they and they brought a book to school called subway art they're like wow look at this 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 stuff kind of reminds us of your work it, it was a book of new york subway graffiti art Mm-hmm. And it's the first time I ever saw Scene and Dondi and these guys who became my heroes. I know Scene now. I'm a friend with him. And it just blows my mind that he was one of my first influences in the art world. Like seeing all these beautiful painted subway cars from like the 70s and 80s in New York just blew my mind. I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to do this. And I immediately went out and took spray paint on my dad's garage. <laughs> and there's this little wash over here between the schools and we hopped the fences and just started spray painting in there <laughs> and I, I was like this is so much fun and it was kind of like it was that, that that growing up like coming out of my shell period of time so it sticks with me like graffiti got me out of my shyness and out of my zone and I found like-minded kids and we all just started skateboarding and doing graffiti together and traveling to go do graffiti and like it it was infiltrating into the music world stuff I was into in the punk scene, like like doing flyers and uh-huh. for people. It just kind of got me out of my shell. I'll say. Yeah. So I know you. I know a little bit about your your relationship with your dad and how supportive he has been. And we can talk about that later. I'm so curious when you came home and you you spray painted oh. the garage. What did your dad say or do? Oh yeah, he wasn't very happy <laughs> a lot of that. It's funny, like. He turned it around, though. I, I'm impressed with his parenting skills because I know me now. I'd be like, what are you doing, you know? <laughs> and I have a ton of spray paint here. They, they could just grab and go. And I'm like, oh, man, I hope they don't mess up our house. Oh, they will. I know. They will. <laughs> but, it, but it was like my dad turned it around and said, you know what? And he went and built me a 16-foot wall in the backyard. He's like, spray paint on that. Don't spray paint on the garage. I'm like, okay, cool. And he's like, that'll keep you off the streets. And all it did was give me a place to practice. And when I went out in the streets, I actually knew what I was doing. So it's like, <laughs> it backfired on him because I got good really fast. 
with a can and I figured out like all these tricks with it. And then I would take it out on the streets and the freeways, especially these oil drums off the 110 freeway. And it was just like, I knew what I was doing. And he just kind of kicked himself. He laughs about it later. He's like, he didn't want to know at the time what <laughs> right. I was doing. And he was so busy at work too, that he didn't have time to chase me around. And I was still going to school. I was, I was working. Still getting good grades, still in all the AP classes. Yeah. Well, then I was started, you know, at college, I was in junior college to get all my credits to go into regular school. And that's where the shift happened. But I was working, you know, two jobs. I was a waiter and doing some design work on the side. And so I, in all aspects, I was keeping my crap together. So, mm -hmm. and when I was doing graffiti, I, I still feel like I was like a big brother to everybody around me to make sure everybody's safe. Let's not do go too crazy here. Or, you know, maybe that's like looked down upon in the graffiti world, but I still felt like I was a boy scout. Amongst <laughs> all that. So I don't know. It, it just was that time. And, and all the guys I were meeting, like I still am friends with a lot of these dudes and I think they're great guys and kind of like-minded with me. You meet some scary people and you get, I've gotten into some scary situations. I don't want to go into too much, but you know, I have guns pulled on us and stuff like that. Whoa. I got, I got a bloody nose from a cop once and, and it's just things, dumb stuff happen because you're in the wrong place and wrong part of town and things can happen. You just need to know your surroundings and be street smart. So I learned a lot of that at the same time too, but I, I focus more on the relationships with the people I've met that are now lifelong friends and people who I looked up to became my teachers and mentors, showing me how to use a spray can, showing me how to paint with acrylics. They saw like me working with markers and pencils and said, you should be painting. Yeah. So that first job you got doing the pogs, was that, was that the kind of the turning point from you where you realized, okay, I can make, I can turn this into a quote unquote legitimate career. <laughs> I don't yes. know if that's the right term for it but <laughs> that's a good term for it yeah because it was like I, I i got a task i did working as an illustrator i pretty much sat on this guy's floor for a week and a half stayed out in san diego and just ate pizza and he would go during the day while i was drawing take the designs to work and do all the photoshop and illustrator stuff and next thing you know we had pogs come out that were sold in all these stores around the country and it was a nice paycheck for a 18 year old kid just trying to figure out life. So right. like, that's me. It's my identity. I'm an artist. So <laughs> I love it. That's so cool. I'm curious, like since your entry, I guess I would say into the art world was, um, was sort of transient art, meaning you can't take it with you. That's right. Do you have like a memory of a piece or a painting even now that you've done that you were just really proud of? And what was it about that piece that, that just got you. I was really happy with like all the graffiti stuff for sure, like spray painting walls and just it, what it did in my career, giving me momentum to just learn and grow as an artist. There's a whole lot of walls that stand out. There is one that we did that was based off Nightmare Before Christmas in East LA, and it's still up there. And it was just the guys let me kind of draw what it was going to look like and the sections where they were going to go. So I kind of art directed the wall and it just became this, this really cool thing where it was a ginormous wall. Everybody came together and painted it and it just, everybody talked about it, got all this magazine play like, and it was kind of right when all the internet stuff was started popping off because before that, when we were all learning, there was no internet. There was no like, Hey, here, I did a piece. Everybody see, right. you have, you'd have to go to graffiti yards and different meetups and spots and they weren't always safe. But that's how you met and got your work out to other people. And, and we weren't doing it to get paid. We weren't doing it for any of that. We just did it for – it was like a sport. You, it was like, oh, here, check out my stuff. Check out my stuff. And like who can get the best spots? Who can get the coolest thing up? So that whole aspect of my life is always going to be like my learning ground. But when you say is there a transitional piece, there, there was a transitional piece that – it was the first time I painted with uh, acrylics and brushes. Uh -huh. And – I was commissioned by my buddy, Gary Sanders, who I worked with at this skateboard company called Serial Killer. And he said, I want you to do a painting for me. I'm like, oh, I don't really paint too much with acrylics, but I'm going to try. And I did a Day of the Dead bunny rabbit skull <laughs> with acrylics. And it was like a tattoo style, but rendered like kind of more like a 3D style like I was doing. And I challenged myself and I enjoyed the entire process. 
I made mistakes and fixed it. And I finally started grasping how to complete a painting with acrylics. And that piece stands out as my first finished acrylic piece. And I was for a friend and he commissioned it. He wanted to pay for it. He wanted to do a legit transaction. He's like, this is what you're going to do because this, I think, is your future. And after that, all the guys at the tattoo shop started going, oh, I want a painting too. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's, this is awesome. And so it just became one painting after another and it snowballed after that into I'm painting with acrylics now. I can't believe I'm pulling this off. <laughs> and And at that time, I was just about, I think I just started working in video games or I was still working at Jinko Jeans, which was a horrible spot, but it was a job as an illustrator, uh-huh. street work. And it was that it was right around that transition. And I had a friend, yeah, it was when I was in video games, I had a friend there said, let's make a website for you. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. It's like, don't worry, we're a bunch of computer geeks here. So I'm going to set you up. And so my friend showed me how to make I'm scared.com, which was just the very first one was like a red with pink lettering. <laughs> Early HTML, like hand coded yeah. everything. Yep. Yep. And I didn't know what I was doing, but he helped me. And we started putting the artwork up. And then later I had other friends help me. My buddy Ian Reese helped me. My buddy Work, who's a graffiti writer, helped do my websites. But at the same time, MySpace came out and I uploaded everything to MySpace. And next thing you know, I was, I was like, oh my gosh what's happening? All these people are following me and, and commissioning paintings from Australia to Germany to Sacramento up north. You know, it was just like, all of a sudden I had this audience I'd never even thought would happen. And people were buying paintings, which I wasn't expecting. I was just doing this stuff and sharing it. I never thought I was going to get paid for paintings. I thought it was just something for fun that I was going to do. And it was for me. And then you would continue to do illustration work on the side? Is that what you were thinking? Well, at that time, I was working in video games. So I was working on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, doing background art for all the levels. And I worked on that in Spider-Man at the time. And so I thought I'd just be working in video games, doing illustration work you know, for various bands or whatever, and then paint for me. Mm-hmm. All the paintings – and that's the thing about the, my paintings. They're basically all for me. Even the commissions, we steer it so it's like it's got to be something that I would do that would naturally fit my world or I pretty much won't do it. Right. Right. So I think from the beginning, my paintings have always been for me making this world that my brain gets to go to. And it's my escape. You know, it's my escapism. I get to paint this stuff. Yeah. People come alongside to go on the journey. That's awesome. So I know you, you work pretty, I mean, compared to painting walls, you work pretty small now comparatively, right? Well, compared to a wall. Yeah. But, yeah. My last, but I still paint like nine by six foot canvases and stuff like that as well. This is kind of, um, I don't know if it's a weird question or not, but I get a lot of questions from people who are who are asking about, who are used to painting small and then want to go big. And you kind of did the opposite. Oh, yeah. Where you started big and went small. What were some of the challenges or if there were challenges of going big from big to small? And also what kind of advice do you have for artists who are used to working small who want to just blow it up? Wow. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. uh, Since I did start painting like big walls, going small was the easiest thing in the world. I can be (laughs) honest. It was just like, oh, okay. I just take this little brush and do this here. Cool. Wow. This is not that big a deal. Like, and and so when I approach like an eight foot by six foot canvas, like some of the paintings I emailed you, like good night or where am I or no strings, I look at it and then I sit there and I go, this is really cool pretty small compared to that wall we did in East LA or something like that. And and it, it doesn't scare me anymore. I just think of just blocking in, starting from the far back, working my way forward and just pace myself and be patient. I don't know. I would just tell somebody who's trying to go big from small just to be very patient and to understand how their paint dries. Because I paint acrylics. So if I'm working on a big background, I just have to be wary of how the paint's going to dry and the, how fast it dries and and just work section by section very carefully. And then I don't have problems. And then I also, I know people learn this stuff just with brushes, but I learned it from spray paint. Like you work from the back to the front, you leave those areas, you know, you're going to put something so you can get messy in that area. Like I'll overbrush into areas that are su- are going to get painted over anyways. Mm-hmm. So I'll get sloppy and drippy or, or messy in that area, knowing I can brush into it and it can leave brush strokes there to get rid of the brush strokes in the clean area 
because I'm just going to paint over that spot. So that's kind of my saving grace. I just keep thinking, oh, I'll just mess it up into here. And I'll keep messing up this painting till it's not messed up. Right, right. Yeah. That makes sense. So that's what it feels like. Very cool. So I've had a lot of requests, I guess I would say, because I, I tend to, without not on purpose, but I guess I tend to talk to mostly oil painters. And so I, I get a lot of requests for, can you get somebody on who works in acrylic? So oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> please. <laughs> so this is for the acrylic painters out there. So I, because I come from the oil painting background, when I use acrylics, I tend to go for the super thick, heavy bodied acrylics, but I know you use the the lighter acrylics. Can you talk a little bit about just maybe some of the details of acrylic painting and somebody who's kind of new to it, what are the pros and cons of uh, those different types of acrylic paints? Does that make sense? Yeah, no problem. I use fluid acrylics. I barely, rarely ever touch heavy body. I haven't really picked up heavy body acrylics in years. What I do is I mix a color, like I say a grayscale, but there's a little bit of warm tones to it. I'll mix like a 30% I'll say gray, but it's like an umbery gray, a mm -hmm. warm gray. I'll mix a 90% close to black, 10% close to white, but it's really like dark browns to warm grays. And I'll generally do an underpainting on my sections if I go from section to section. This isn't every time either, but this is just a way to work with acrylics that makes laying in color easy. So when I tell, I've taught seminars and I'll, I'll show this demo where I'll, I'll render out, let's say we're doing like a giant clownfish or a skull. I'll render the entire creature in this gray scale, leaving the darks not to black and the whites not to white. I won't ever use white until the very end. And I'll completely render the character. And then I'll, for my colors, I use the transparent colors that they have, like a yellow iron oxide, Indian yellow, green gold, red iron oxide, and whatever other transparent paints I have at my fingertips. And then I can mix those amongst each other or with other little colors in them. So I'll have these various transparent paints I can mess around with. Mm. And then I will make sure the underpainting's dry, you know, blow dry it. And say I want to put some yellow iron oxide into the creature, maybe I want an undertone of this yellow. I'll just dampen the area a little bit with some water and just a couple drops of paint. And then I'll take like a, a damp brush, not fully dry, not fully wet, and just start brushing it through. And you'll just see it, this thing starts taking on all this color. And I I did all the heavy lifting with the grayscale. So all of a sudden I have this yellow fish that's has all the different, you know, lights and darks. And I didn't really have to use that yellow, which is harder to work with to make those lights and darks. And then mm. I come in with the reds on top of it. I just blow dry in between and lock down the layer and do sections of the red and blend the edges, blow dry it. And then it looks like the red was blended into the yellow as if they were wet into wet, but they never were. It was, it's the red on top of the yellow with a fuzzy edge and it's dry now. And it just looks like those, those edges are blending into each other but it was all done in layers and I can work in those layers because you can blow dry it and it dries so fast. I can jump into the next layer really quick. And then if I want another area to pop up higher, I'll take like that light tone of gray or whatever, and I'll, I'll make some highlights and then I'll blow dry it and I'll wash it with that, with that yellow or red or green again, and just keep doing layers of highlights and then washes highlights and then washes. And then I'll come in with like shadow colors and stuff. I don't know if this makes sense if I'm just babbling. It does. No, it totally does. I can absolutely see it. I think that it's interesting because I've never worked with that type of acrylic. And so I'm just kind of like, wow, that's how you do it, number one. And also, yeah. I haven't played with it enough to kind of get to the point where like, where I'm thinking, wow, you can really get some amazing glazes with acrylics. Oh, yeah. I, I remember seeing something on the internet or hearing somebody, an oil printer, like laughing to his class saying, believe it or not, you cannot glaze with and do what you cannot do glazes with acrylics. And I and it just struck me. I said, huh. And I sat there and I just started doing glazes. I'm like, then what am I doing? What is this? What's it called then? Because I, I need a name for it. 
And everybody says, oh, your paintings look like oils. I'm like, that's not intentional. On my paintings, I'm just trying to make them look like that thing I'm painting. I'm not trying to make it look like an oil painting. I'm trying to make it – say I'm painting something from life, like some snails or something. I'm trying to make it look like those snails. I'm not trying to make it look like an oil painting. I want it to look like those snails. Whatever the outcome is, I don't quite nail it, but it's – whatever it is that the medium lets me do. Because I never really did oils. I did oils in college for a class, but that was one of the classes I was ditching to go surf and go spray paint. <laughs> and so, because I didn't like the teacher, I didn't, I, 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 and I, that was a dumb thing. I should have paid attention to that class more. But I maybe did one oil painting. I passed the class, thank goodness. And then I got more serious after that. But it was, I, I just didn't like it. And then it yeah. was years or I picked up a paintbrush again. Like I didn't learn to paint in college. I learned watercolor, which I I, I just got by in because it was fun. But I learned how to render really well and do life drawing and all that stuff, which I thought was invaluable. Yeah. Where did you go to school? I went to Long Beach State, Cal State University, Long uh, Beach. And yeah. They had you know a little illustration department and studio art department. They've it. got a great program. Yeah, I liked it. I liked junior college. I feel like I learned more. I, I hate to say it, but I, I I started taking life drawing there and I was like, oh my gosh. And my teachers there were so, so like hands-on and they wanted, they hung out after school and we talked art. Like I had a lettering teacher named Rodman De La Cruz and he would like have us over drink wine and we would draw and just talk about art, not just lettering, but all kinds of art and, and the old masters. And he introduced us to so much stuff that I never got that kind of attention at Long Beach State. I enjoyed it and I learned a lot. I had a couple of teachers there that I really thought were invaluable, especially in life drawing and in, in etching of all things. I had a really good teacher. But I always tell everybody I went to Long Beach State to meet my, that, to meet my wife because I got lucky with that one. So I met her on my year out and her year in. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that was 1999, 98, 99. I met her and we've been together since. And she's a awesome, amazing, beautiful, but her mind is so like organized and on point. I'd be a mess without her. I know. I was so impressed just as a side note, getting this call set up. Your wife was Jen, right? Yeah, Jen. She was all over it. I'm like, I was like, that's fantastic. (laughs) She organizes our entire business and our entire life. I bet. I bet. It is so great to have someone with that, that capability. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, it it's awesome. It's a fun team. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Actually, after today, after I get off the phone with you, it's it's her work day, so I'm taking the kids today because they're still in summer. I'm like, we're going to the aquarium. We're going to go to Cabrillo <laughs> Beach, so uh, so mommy can work without you guys yanking on her. <laughs> that's perfect. I love it. It seems like you experiment also a lot with your with your work and with you, your materials. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, of course. I, I think like right now I, I'm, I've been secretly collecting like a bunch of oils and supplies because I'm going to do a bunch of oil studies just because I think it'd be fun to, uh, to sharpen that tool up in my tool belt. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it. I've been really excited about the prospect of it. I just have some projects I have to get done first. A few years back, I had my buddy Sergio Sanchez, who's one of my idols in the art world, and he's an amazing tattooer. He was a, an art instructor for a long time at Art Center, but he's just some guy, somebody I knew through friends. He challenged me and said, why don't you pick up charcoals, man? I think you would enjoy it a lot. Your pencil drawings are amazing, but you can go so much bigger with charcoals. And I said, huh, that's a good idea. Come by with and show me the setup. So he came by my studio, brought this the type of paper he uses, and just brought what his setup was. So I duplicated his setup and and I took his lesson and I got serious with it and I started doing a ton of charcoal drawings. Now it's one of my favorite things in the world to do, and I've been doing these large charcoal busts of different creatures, and I don't see myself stopping anytime soon because it's just. It's really nice to switch from painting to doing charcoals, doing ink illustrations, to doing pencil drawings, to doing computer graphics. I, I, I still do computer graphics and work in Illustrator. And it's just there's so many things you can do with art. It's fun to not limit myself to just one thing. Yeah, I love that, that it's just it's also playful and such an experiment. And it's just like when you're when you see it as play and not as something that is so serious. Yeah, you can have fun and you get more creative and you 
you discover things. Exactly. Yeah. I, I've, it's been fun since day one. Like I, I, it's still like, I can't wait till Monday just so I can get in the studio and, and just have fun, make art. <laughs> I love it. What were some of the things that you, that you discovered when you switched, when you started playing with charcoal? What is it about charcoal that you really responded to? I liked how you could reblend into things. That's what that's what I'm looking forward to with oils. Like you could, like I I use paintbrushes and stuff. I use my treacle paintbrushes on the and the charcoal drawings. Like I just use some giant filberts and and I I'll blend out areas and you lay it down the the vine charcoal really heavy in that area and you can blend it out with that brush and I, it's just like wow oh I want to re I want to knock the area back again take a chamois knock it back and then reblend into it. It's just the looseness you can have with it for so long before mm-hmm. you tighten it up. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like to just block in areas, squint my eyes and just not look at the detail for a long time and just keep blocking in shapes. Like, oh, that shape's just a triangle. I'm going to make a triangle. Oh, that, that there's a, tr- a darker triangle within that triangle. I'm going to put that in there. Now I'm going to blend it through. Oh my gosh, this is looking like a face. Yeah. It's like, if you think of it as shapes and not faces, then you can skip the detail till the end and you can get a more accurate representation. Yeah. Yeah. That whole idea of not naming what it is that you're painting or, or holding back on. Some people call it not making decisions too quick or keeping it open or making, yeah, that, that whole concept of yeah. just looking at shapes and not saying that's a cheek, that's an eye, that's a, you know, that's an ear, but just looking at the the, shape. the big thing. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, it's strangely hard though, isn't it? Because you, you, yeah. you start off that way and then you start thinking, okay, cool. This is looking like a good ear. Yep. Yeah. And that, that's another thing I learned from Sergio Sanchez. He was very like big about saying that that is a triangle or that's a rectangle. Get, just block in that shape. And that was part of that, that demo he gave me. And I was like, you know what? I, I do that, but I, I didn't consciously say it. And mm-hmm. him saying it, Knowing his background and as as an amazing instructor, but artist himself, I'm like, he said it. I'm gonna do it, and that's that's a thing. Uh, that's I have to make it a, a conscious thing instead of unconsciously doing it. And it changed the way I drew with pencils. It changed the way I painted. It it just worked itself back into my other tools. That's why I want to jump back and play with oils in because I know it's gonna it's gonna talk to the other tools I work with. Yeah. I'm so curious. I would love to see what you do in oils. I think that's so exciting to like just completely switch over and and see what you know. The interesting thing is when I when I was in school, they wanted us to sort of play around with all the. I went to art center as well, and we would have painting classes in oil and painting classes in acrylics, and you you just had to switch back and forth. Like you might be in painting, doing a painting in full oil one day or one Uh morning. And then that, that evening you're working in acrylic. So it's, it is a different thought process because you have to think ahead a little bit or you, you think differently and switching back and forth was hard, but eventually, at least then I was able to do it without thinking so much. I think now it would be a little bit harder because I've been focused on, on oils, Yeah, but there's so much about acrylic that's so fun to work with and, and kind of, and really cool. I have a question for you then. Have you ever messed around with doing your underpaintings in, all, in acrylics and then coming back with oil? And yeah. Doing... So the answer, because I get different answers about this. My buddy Bob Dobb works that way a bit. He, he does oils, but he'll do like a je- different tones of gesso as his underpainting. I love that technique. But is there a ground you have to put a layer that you put between the acrylic before you put the oil down? No, I don't. Although, you know, it's interesting. I do a very, I'm working with the full bodies, but I'm using thin washes of it or mixing medium in it. Uh huh. And then I'll just block it all in and get everything where I want it because, you know, it's acrylic. It's fast. I can just start painting immediately. Yep. And I don't, I don't use anything, but I have, and I haven't had any problems with it. Okay, cool. But I, I've heard that same thing. And that's, that's interesting because when I was, talking with I did I did a an episode with Gamblin Artist Colors and they they make oil paints. They're exclusively oils. Yeah, and right. they did mention something about that in a in a side conversation that that I didn't dive deep really deep into with them. But there I think yeah. there might be something there, but I've never I've never ex- you know, I think like technically maybe it's a better adherence. Yeah. If it's oil on oil or if you're using the gesso. Yeah. But you know, I mean since 
1990. I've never seen any problems with the paintings doing anything weird. Awesome. So that would be <laughs> that's, that's a good that's a good answer. That's what I want to hear. <laughs> okay. I, I have st- I usually put like matte medium. I would generally probably put it down anyways as a ground just because my head makes me want. To, I yeah. always do that. But I was, there's some stuff called GAC 200 or GAC 400 that Golden makes. I heard is good also, but I haven't tried it, so I was curious if that was even something. Yeah. And then, I mean, now there's paints that, you know, that are fast dry, oil paints, I mean, that are fast drying. And so I know people, people use those to do the underpainting and then oil on top of it so that you've got gesso oil, oil. God. So my experience says there's no, like, it doesn't really matter, but I know that some people are very particular about that. So that always makes me think, huh? So we might get some comments from this episode with people. Yeah. <laughs> a good conversation to have, I think at least. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Another question that, that I have that um, I love to ask this because it re- I think it really helps other artists who are out there because we're all, we're all in our studios painting away and sometimes it feels kind of like we're the only ones or we don't really know what, what other people are doing and people are experiencing something that's kind of challenging. And it's good to hear other people who have gone through these challenges and have come out on the other side. So I would love to hear like if you have a story of a time in, when you encountered a setback or you experienced some sort of a failure or big challenge, but more importantly, what did you take away from that experience? Yeah. I always think time management is the biggest hurdle for me because of balancing time, family, and all that kind of stuff. And when my my dad was living out here, he was like my biggest help. He was running things back and forth, building canvases for me, building panels, really helping transport stuff, helping pick up the kids from school, like while I was working throughout the day. And I, I feel like I took advantage of it because it, it was just there and I was so happy, like, like, oh, dad, I need help with this. Oh, I'm right over. And they had to move up to Washington for various reasons this last year. And it was at the time right before I had a huge show and there was stuff I had. My mom had open heart surgery, all this stuff was going on and we couldn't get stuff done. And I felt like I was, I was falling behind and and I was worried about them, but just super stressed. I'm like, oh, I got to keep, I got to keep plowing away and getting stuff done. Like, oh, how am I going to go get this stuff made? Or how am I going to go drop this off? Or, oh, I got to stop and go pick up the kids from school. And it was just became a frustrating time in our life. It was right before my no string show. And I, I just felt myself in a panic every day. And it was kind of just like, I needed to shut up, sit down and slow down and not be so fast paced. I don't know if I have this Los Angeles mentality of just running like like a bat out of hell all the time. <laughs> I've never slowed down and I had to I had to stop and slow down because I was getting like frantic and, and anxiety like crazy and it was just affecting me throughout the day and I, it wouldn't I didn't don't really get mental blocks when painting or drawing because if the ideas there, it's just it's technical at that point. It's just mechanical. I can turn off and just do the job, do the painting mm-hmm. and not have to feel like super creative. Like it, it's, it's the drawing time is, is the more creative time. And so it was just that period of time last year, probably around December, I was just like a mess. And, and then when I finally slowed down and I finally saw that they were safe and happy and moved in and thriving up in Washington, I started calming down and got through my show, which went really well. And and just after seeing that stuff pass, I'm like, did being anxious, did being so frantic help or change any bit of the process? And it didn't. It just made things worse. It was kind of like a lesson, like you got to just calm down. Life's going to go on. You're going to have your hurdles and up and down and just just relax. It's, 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 it's hard. I never like relax really. <laughs> I have that same issue and I have to constantly remind, I mean, even when you slow down, you get so, it's so counterintuitive, but when you slow down and you understand that painting is a part of your life yeah, and it's a big part of your life, but it's not your whole life. You have a family, you have in your case, you've got kids that are depending on you and you have your parents that are depending on you. And obviously, if something's going on with anybody in your family, 
that's an enormous worry that's on you. Um, and so just kind of like understanding what your priorities are and focusing on just this, this is the thing that I can, I can do right now that is going to help this whole situation. So I'm going to sit down, focus, do that. And yeah, all that worry, all that stress, you know, all those other things that we do inside our head, it can sound really cold, you know, to some people, I think, but it doesn't help any, like you said, it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help anything. So like, it's so that, that ability to just say, okay, I'm going to do everything that I, I can to help, this situation and the things that I can't do anything about, I'm going to have to just let them go. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only way to get through it. It's crazy. That it's so hard. <laughs> yeah. It is yeah. so hard, you know, because I'm sure everybody has had situations where they're just incredibly worried about a family member or there's other things going on outside of the studio that can easily affect your time in the studio and just figuring out how to I hate the word, you know, like it's so overused right now, but how to balance your life. No, that's, it, that's, that is so important. I think that's hugely important to like everybody that asks me about art stuff. It, it always becomes a topic about that because to me, like the art stuff's there, the ideas are there, the making it, but it's all the stuff around it that keeps me from making art. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is my concern usually. And then balancing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that's something that, gets glossed over a lot. I get questions a lot from people who have young children or, you know, just as a parent, there's these different phases of your life. There's sort of like the newborn and then there's the toddler and then they get into grade school and then good luck, they become teenagers. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, all throughout that, you've got different, different things and you can't there's not many people and you, I would not recommend this as parents that you can just decide like, okay, I'm going to lock that part out of my, like, I'm, I'm only an artist and whatever. Yeah, you're, of course, you that. they're your kids. Of course, you're going to be thinking about them and worried about them. Yep. Yep. Like, yeah, that, like I said today, like I had to get my head around it. I'm like, okay, you're going to go look at tide pools and stuff today. And I know I have stuff to get done, but my, the business side needs to get done too. People need to be emailed back. Accounting needs to happen. That orders need to be filed. And Jen is spot on it. And she's like, I need all day today and tomorrow. So it's it's still work. That's still part of the business mm-hmm. of art. So I got to, in my head, I have to say that it's right. Work is getting done. I don't need to stress. I need to turn off and go fly a kite. So, and that's... <laughs> It sounds so funny, but yeah, it's true. And being present, you know, this is something that, you know, I've talked with, with students of mine in in workshops and stuff that you, you know, if you can, if you can decide what your priorities are, and you honor those priorities, then when you're in your studio painting, you can be in your studio painting. And when you're out flying a kite, you can be out flying a kite. Yes. And then that becomes inspirational on its own, just being out there in those experiences and living it. Then you go, oh, well, that's popping in the back of my head something. Next thing you know, you're painting about kites and stuff. (laughs) What are some, uh, I'm curious, you know, because there's, there's actually so, I mean, I know it's sometimes sounds a little bit boring to, to talk about the business side of, of art, but what are, what are some of the ways that you and Jen sort of balance all of that? Well, she does, she runs the website and a lot of the business Facebook account. And then um, she sets up the online store. She gets prints made and, and fulfills orders on all that and does and talks to the people about it. Anybody that contacts us with any kind of business from gallery to product to toys, you name it, goes directly to her. And she organizes the calendar on the yes or no things. And she gets it in, the, in a timeline, sets up my calendar so I know what I'm doing. And we go from there. So she pretty much has first and final say on the projects <laughs> we take because she knows what can get done in the timing and she knows what's in the pipeline. And and she also, you know, negotiates prices and which has taken years to figure out. And she has a lot of resources she checks out, like uh, MarieBrophy.com is a good uh-huh. business resource. And then she at ArtBusiness.com. And like she used to, back when I was doing like, I did a cover or two for, it was Art Calendar at the time, but they changed the name of it, but she was talking to them. 
you know, getting all the business side of things figured out. I don't know. She's just figured it out over the years. Like she was in marketing and, and business for some cosmetic companies and then for a healthcare company. And she knew the ins and out of a lot of this. So she just applied her skills into what we do and we just work from home now. Yeah, that's great. So you, you have this, it's a, it's amazing. And I think it's a lot of people's dreams that you have somebody that's taking care of the business side for you yeah, so that you can focus on, on the creative aspects of it. What advice do you have for people who don't have a gen? Okay. I didn't always have a gen doing my side of the job, which, which is, so she was working her job and finishing school and then taking off into her career. So she wasn't always doing my stuff. And I would set up my own calendars and reminders. And, and I, I have to use a lot of to-do lists. I don't know if I'm borderline ADD or whatever, but I have I need lists and everything oh, God. To, yes. <laughs> to focus me. And so I just worked with on lists and emails and I did all that stuff myself. Um, it wasn't until Jen stepped in that we actually just had really st- stronger lists, I guess, but she negotiated my, my pricing better. It's nice to have somebody to negotiate your prices because no artist wants to put a price on their art and talk mm-hmm. money. And yeah. she's to do that just nonchalantly like, well, this is what it's worth. This is what we historically sell for. This is the pricing. And she's good at that. I was always bad at pricing my stuff and underpriced my stuff for years. And then I started getting more savvy. And you know, I, I don't want to give away everything, but since this is artists to artists, there have been times where we had right in the beginning that we had a business email and I would answer emails as a third person sometimes just to create a barrier of this is what Greg's pricing is. This is what he does these jobs for. Mm-hmm. And once when, when you have a, some kind of a middleman or a person doing that for you, if you have a friend do it or if you need to just step in and take over sometimes for that friend that's helping you out and say, this is his pricing as a third person so you can negotiate without that pressure of like, this is, I want to price this for my painting. And that person saying that's too high and getting all like, you have to understand that there is a negotiation process that everybody's going to do. And it's, it's not to be offensive. Right. Right. That's so interesting because I think having that buffer is brilliant. And I, I just had a conversation with somebody about galleries versus selling your work online and our galleries going away. And so we were talking about the the pros and cons of galleries versus selling it on your own. And I think it's definitely a pro for the gallery side that you have somebody who does that for you. You have somebody who can be, who can objectively negotiate like that without, it just seems like as artists or even as the person selling the product, it's really hard to separate yourself from that and it is and not be, you know, not allow emotion to come in, which is, you know, the worst thing in any negotiation is to get emotional about it. And that, and that's why I don't want to see the galleries go away, especially the good ones. Like there's yeah. a lot of galleries that don't do anything for you. I, I feel really blessed that we, we work with Mary Karnowski. They do a lot for us and her and Jessica and James at KP Projects, which is the name of the gallery. Like they've been great and I like how they work and they are that middleman and they do gain new clients and, and viewers for the pieces. There's a lot of galleries out there that don't do that. They just have the four walls and think that they're doing a favor. Yeah. Those are the ones that are going to disappear because online is taking over everything. And I, I can see it's going to be tough in the future, but for those galleries who do go out of their way for their artists, I think they'll stick around, but it's going to thin the herd a lot. Oh yeah. And I, I mean, actually I think it's, <laughs> to be frank, I think it's, I think it's a good thing when you have yeah. galleries like yours who are, who are using that as a, as the tool that it is, and they're serving, you know, like they, they understand that this is a business and yep. they have to make money and the artist has to make money. And there's a relationship there that both sides have equal parts in. I think the galleries that understand that this isn't going to, I mean, they may, they're going to struggle at some point yeah. like any business does, but, but this won't be the make it or break it for them. But I think the, exactly what you said, yeah. those galleries that think that, you know, okay, I've got four walls and we're going to hang some paintings up yeah. and, and all that, that it's yeah. Great. Yeah. Let I, it thin the herd. And I also think that the galleries, the gallerists are really going to need to become savvy with their internet and online presence. It, it, you, they have to be to keep up. They have to have that presence. They have to understand what social media does. They have to understand what even online sales, like people are so into click and purchase that if you have to go through hoops 
to buy something, they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I've heard it from people and I just, you got to make it easier for a person to buy something if they want to buy something. Yeah. And they don't have to struggle to do it because they can just go to this site here and, oh, I got it. Just boom, done. There's just a lot of keeping up with those technical trends Yeah, that needs to occur. But I think what's behind what you just said, which is the most important thing, is understanding I guess, customer service in a way, you want to make this easy on, on the people who are buying your art. <laughs> so oh, if you're making yes. them jump through hoops, it's not respectful. Yeah. Yeah. It's not respectful. It's frustrating. And, and it's just silly. I mean, if you just think if I, you know, as you were saying that I was thinking about, I don't know, several episodes ago, I mentioned this particular paint is called marble white. And and then of course, everybody was asking about marble white, and I picked it up at a conference. And so then I had to track down where do you buy this thing? Yep. And it turns out there's only two places in the US that distribute it. And so I go to both of their websites, and one of them, it was impossible to find. And one of them, I put marble white in and boom, it was there. And so I'm like, that's the one that got the recommendation because I could find it in two seconds. Yep. And I knew I wasn't going to get a bunch of questions about, well, you said this website did it, but I can't find it anywhere because I had to put in like six different search terms in order for it to come up on their website. So I'm like, okay, done. That's uh. impossible. So with with finding people's artwork and with galleries and with what we're talking about, it's that. I mean, I, I don't mean any disrespect to compare a tube of paint <laughs> to a painting, but there's the collector's experience. And every single yeah. time that you make them do something difficult or you make them jump through another hoop, it's just makes the process annoying. And if you can make the process from start to finish something that was easy or even fun. <laughs> yeah, pleasant, right? <laughs> yeah. Then that's doing a lot of the work. That's yeah. doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah. And people yeah. are like, oh, I wanna I'm gonna go through them again because I like the work, but they're easy to work with. And that's not always a hundred percent of the time. We try to keep it that way. Some stuff is just hard to keep up with too. Like there'd be tons of questions coming through. But yeah, for the most part, I think we have a pretty clean record with like trying to keep it a pleasant experience at least. Yeah. Yeah. And at least, I mean, you know, this is, again, this is going to sound really weird, but at least you're thinking about that. I think a lot of those same galleries that we were talking about before that, that kind of just want to put up the four walls and be done. They're not even considering that. So it kind of no. sounds like, you know, like you guys have that process down and, or at least, you know, as, as best as you can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're conscious of it for sure. Yeah. I think it's an important part of it. Huge. Yeah. And easily overlooked, I think. Yeah. What are you working on right now? What is your current project or obsession? Well, there's a few things I'm working on. Just a series that I want to have available for fall. I, I've been there's two series, and one I'm going to be calling Rabbit Season, and then the other I'm calling it's just been Crail as Birds of Summer, just because I'm obsessed with bird studies right now and everything I can do and change and work on with them. And a couple of the pieces are going to some group shows. I'm in the Trakel group show coming up, mm -hmm. and then. I'm working on a piece I just finished for Life is Beautiful in Las Vegas. It's the big music festival. I'm in a show that's curated by M. Modern and Mark Ryden, and it has a really bunch of really awesome artists in it. And I'm stoked to be part of it again this year. So I just finished a piece for that. I'm going to be going out to, to Las Vegas for that in September. And then we're working on a secret project with my I'm Scared the Movie team that <laughs> it, we've been sitting down and working on my, with my director and producer, both Pete Levin and Dan Levy. And I'm very excited to see where this may go. And I can't say too much, but if it was from I'm Scared of the Movie, you know, it's, it's not just paintings and drawings. So it might be something else. Right. When do you expect that to kind of get to the point where they're public about it? Well, I think we need a few more meetings. <laughs> ah, <But> okay. <laughs> we're in meetings, which is awesome. And it, it's a fun world that we created to start off with our stop motion short. And if anybody hasn't seen it, it's on YouTube, which is called I'm Scared. Or you can type in I'm Scared, the movie, see four tunes. But that's, it's a fun five-minute stop motion animated short, which was, it's been going around the film festivals and winning awards, which is beyond our wildest dreams when we first started it. So I'm really proud of my team. Those guys did all the heavy lifting. I just did front-end stuff. Like we wrote the story and then me and Pete and Dan rewrote it and then the concept art. But all the hard work those guys did was just amazing to watch. It was an education and the whole thing is an education. So very cool. Is there anything else you're working on that you want to talk about? Gosh, I feel like I'm always working on something. I was working on, on paintings and on experiments with different mediums. I have a 
director friend who's been documenting stuff the last like four or five years. And so he's working on a documentary that should be coming out soon. Jordan Ahern is his name, Ahern Media. And so we should probably see something from that in the upcoming months. So I'm excited about that too. Cool. And last question, if you could own a piece of art by any living artist, what would it be or whose? James Nares, I think. He does these beautiful brushstroke paintings that it's abstract art. It's like, I like his larger works. He makes his brushes and uh, applies just different shapes out of them. It's just one giant brushstroke or a few. Whoa, and cool. Beautiful color. I, I really like abstract art. And I like stuff like that, that just looks beautiful on a big empty wall with a giant swath of paint. Like it's, it's weird that I think I would collect more stuff like that if I collect it or I like, Oh, what's this guy's name? Hold on. I got an artist for you. That is by far my favorite artist right now. His name's Christopher Marley and he does taxidermy and he does it with found creatures that died of natural causes. So it's very ethical. He's, he's very upfront about that, but the way he lays out his birds or his insects, even rocks and flowers, the way he preserves the creatures or the snakes is really beautifully done. It just looks like modern art to me. And it's just, he does these layouts of parrots and it's just their back section of their wings. And he's amazing. If anybody wants to follow him, his name's pheromone underscore Christopher Marley. That's on Instagram. His website is, I think it it's just pheromone or just Google Christopher Marley. Yeah. Well, I'll find a, I'll find a link for that and put it up for, for that, that sounds really cool, though. So, is he doing? He's he's creating scenes with these taxidermied animals. Just really beautifully laid out. It's really organized, beautifully laid out pieces with his taxidermy. Cool. And people have asked what, what I would collect. Like, I already have some butterflies, and just stuff like that is what I would hang in my house because I love it. Yeah. But if I was to collect, own any piece of art, it would be from a dead artist. It'd be like Hieronymus Bosch or it'd be Caravaggio. It'd be something like that. That That's if I could get like my ultimate, you know, painting, it'd be something like yeah. one of the old dead masters. That's ultimately what I'm really interested in. Or even like, you know, something from the Hudson River School, one of those guys that it would be something like that. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think it's, you know, like, I, I asked that question, because it tells me a lot about the artist that I'm talking to. And also, selfishly, I get introduced to all these artists that I've never heard of before, usually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I do it for that reason, too. <laughs> I mean, I would collect, I, I would get like, a piece by this artist named Zess, Z-E-S out here. I need to save up my money, my pennies. <laughs> my wife's not really like, trying to get me to go out buying stuff. But he's, one of my favorite artists and he's a graffiti artist and his work is abstract font based and it's beautiful. And also another artist I would collect is seen just, he was my first inspiration into the graffiti world. And he's called the godfather of graffiti. He's from New York. It was in the seventies kind of started this whole world off and, and he's still killing it in the museum wow. and, and gallery world. And I just like, I like the history and graffiti is still some of my favorite stuff. So I would probably collect graffiti artists and abstract art and taxidermy would probably be what I would collect. Cool. Very cool. So I know you need to go to the tide pools and, and go fly a kite yep. with your kids. So I'm going to let you go, but thank you so much for, for talking with me. It was a lot of fun. And I just, I really enjoy how enthusiastic and excited you are about not just your art, but learning. And it just seems like you're always looking for another way to explore and learn, which I think is really, really cool. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. A big thank you again to Greg for such a great conversation and to Jen for making sure that we were all set up and that things ran smoothly. Show notes for this episode are on SavvyPainter.com. Just click on the podcast tab to see examples of Greg's work. And you can also see that short that we talked about and get links to all of the artists and resources that we mentioned in this episode. Savvy Painter, Gamblin, Artist Colors, and Trakel Art Supplies are teaming up together to do our first online art competition. Artist Carol Marine will be jurying the show. You might remember that Carol was a guest on The Savvy Painter. She's a painter herself and the founder of DailyPaintworks.com. 
first place winner will receive $500 in merchandise from both Gamblin and Trakel, plus a cash prize of $250. But that's not all. The first place winner will also be a guest on the Savvy Painter podcast. So if you win first prize, you get your work in front of tens of thousands of people, a thousand dollars worth of art supplies to paint to your heart's content and some cold hard cash. Entries are being accepted from now until October 29th, 2017. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the Call to Entries tab for more information. I can't wait to see the great work that you submit. Good luck. One more thing I want to let you know. This year, you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. The workshop, How to Develop a Relationship with the Right Gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>